guys and dolls. We're just a bunch of crazy guys and dolls. Hey, hey! Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional theatre critic and a pundit and a content creator here on social media. I get invited to go and review shows and I create videos about them here on YouTube. And today I'm going to be bringing you my slightly updated thoughts on the current West End production of Guys and Dolls. This revival has been running for just over a year now at London's Bridge Theatre. It takes the beloved musical comedy and reinvents it in an immersive, shifting new production that allows audiences to either sit in one of various different seating levels all around the stage or stand amongst the action where they get to move around different moving platforms and changing levels. I was recently invited back to see the show's new cast. Some of the principals from the original cast have stayed, others have changed. We're going to talk about all of the performances as well as my slightly evolved feelings about the show. I reviewed this last year and I was generally very positive about it and all of the creative choices. You can go and watch my original review of the show if you like. I probably go into more detail there than I'm planning to today about how the whole show works from an immersive standpoint. But I also had my reservations about the immersive experience because it was a little bit overwhelming and I'm not the most uh, eager to be in a very busy immersive experience. I get a little bit claustrophobic in crowds, especially in circumstances where I don't have the freedom to move in directions that I want to when I want to. An inclination which does not necessarily pair well with this specific type of entertainment. But I've done some more of these. Now I did Here Lies Love on Broadway. I had the chance to go back to Guys and Dolls last year and then recently again. So I have new thoughts, new feelings that I will be telling you about today. As ever, I am very intrigued to hear what you think who has seen the new cast of Guys and Dolls already, or if you've seen it at any point over the last year, what are your thoughts about the show? Share them with us down below in the comments section. I'm very intrigued to see what people think. Do you think the show has a shot of beating Sunset Boulevard for Best Musical Revival at the Olivier's? I just don't know. Can pure musical comedy joy triumph over really big cinema screens and singing while also being outdoors? That was needlessly shady. They're both great shows. And I'm procrastinating. Let's begin today's review. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to me here on YouTube. You can click the notifications button so you don't miss any of my upcoming reviews and other video content. For now, let's talk about Guys and Dolls, a musical fable of Broadway at the Bridge Theatre with a brand new cast. Let's go. Context, history, synopsis for those of you who do not know the show. Guys and Dolls is kind of like the quintessential musical comedy. We follow a central quartet of characters. Nathan Detroit is trying to find a place to house his floating craps game. That's not as rude as it sounds, it's about cards. No, I lie, it's dice. Clearly, I don't gamble, I just like the hats. Nathan is something of a crook and he has for several years been engaged to the very patient Miss Adelaide. She is a dancer at a burlesque establishment called the Hot Box and she has a perpetual cold which she believes relates to the fact that she hasn't yet been able to marry Nathan, despite the fact that she's been sent letters to her mother for several years that suggest not only are they married, that they are settled down with several children. Meanwhile, in order to set up a bet that he can guarantee he will win so that he can raise the money to pay the deposit for the Biltmore Garage to host his craps game there, Nathan bets a notorious visiting gambler by the name of Sky Masterson that he cannot take any woman he wants to Havana. Specifically, he cannot convince Sergeant Sarah Brown of the local Salvation Army Unit? Unit isn't the word. Mission, that's the one. No less militaristic, it's worth pointing out. Nathan bets Sky that he can't take Sarah with him to dinner in Havana, Cuba, so Sky sets out to do just that. Unexpected romances ensue, and the traditional black and white perspective on, you know, good and bad and gambling and, and ethical behavior is tilted somewhat. More to the point, though it does not contain the song Guys and Dolls, we're just a bunch of crazy guys 
and Dolls, that's from The Simpsons. It does feature a lot of iconic tunes. The actual song, Guys and Dolls, uh, goes like, call it sad, call it funny, cause it's better than even money, that the guy's always doing it for some doll. We also have Luck Be A Lady. We also have Sit Down, You're Rocking The Boat. And the really boring one that the fatherly Salvation Army character sings to Sarah in the second act for no discernible reason. Much like meetings that could have been an email, that's an entire musical theatre song that could have been a very short scene. And should, it's not too late to change. Now, while we're talking about the material, I may or may not have mentioned this the last time I reviewed the show, but every time I go back to this, I'm reminded of the strength of this book and how enduringly funny it is considering its age. The music and lyrics are by Frank Lesser. The book is by Abe Burrows and Joe Swirling. And it is still really funny. All of the material around Adelaide bringing all of these revelations to Nathan about the things that she's told her mother. That's one of those jokes that is set up so brilliantly that it can just keep delivering and delivering and delivering like a reliable postman. It's so, so good. The little joke about when she reveals to him that she's told her mother he's the assistant manager of a local store or whatever it is, and he says, I'm not even the manager, and she says, I was gonna promote you for Christmas. That's gold dust comedy. It's so good. And so much of it holds up. It's characterful. The meeting between Sergeant Sarah Brown and uh, Sky Masterson, where he goes into the mission pretending to be a repentant sinner, and then it turns into a flirtatious back and forth between them. The thinly veiled sexual tension becomes increasingly less thinly veiled, and he mentions to her that uh, one of the signs in the mission is wrong. It's not actually Proverbs, it's actually Isaiah, because he actually is an expert in Bibles, because they have them in every hotel room in the country, and he's visited a lot of hotels. For this to have been from the golden age of musical theater, that's a meeting that is much more convincing to me than something like Carousel, where these two characters meet and almost instantly sing If I Loved You to each other. Now, admittedly, Sarah and Skye do have to sort of clumsily stumble into the song I'll Know, which isn't really very well set up by the book, but we have to get into it somehow, and it's a lovely song. In a perfect world, they would sing something more directly at each other, and they wouldn't prove their stubborn points by singing about their hypothetical loves to people they've never really met before. There are also a couple of dubious lines in this script. I think I've previously got on record to say that the end of Act 1, where Sarah says, I'm a mission doll, is maybe my least favourite line in the show, but I stand corrected because there is a joke that the police sergeant, or I think I'm getting his rank wrong, Lieutenant, he's Lieutenant Brannigan, there you go. When many of the gamblers end up in the Save Us All mission in the second act, he remarks he's never seen so many of them spending time in a mission before, and then he has this punchline, this alleged punchline, where he says maybe that's why they call them Holy Rollers. In multiple productions of this show, having been in a production of this show, I have never once experienced that joke landing at all. It's awful. But the establishing dialogue when we first meet him, and he's trying to sort of intimidate Nathan and the other players and let them know that he's going to be watching them very carefully. Nathan has a line to Brannigan where he says, well, the heat is on, as you must know by the fact that you now have to live on your salary, implying things about uh, police bribery. And that's just one of the really great lines in this script. Sky Masterson's little mini monologue about being wary of placing bets with people who are trying to trick him and rig the system, the whole cider in the ear thing, everything that Sarah says when they go to Havana, that whole sequence where she is unexpectedly charmed by the trip and doing all of the sightseeing and doesn't realize she's drinking a cocktail and says this would be a great way of getting children to drink milk. Like, it's really funny. This material is still so good. And by and large, the music is also phenomenal. That is why Guys and Dolls still sounds up. It's a great show. But as I mentioned in the introduction, this production is more than a little bit different. Let me briefly tell you why. So director Nicholas Heitner, who had directed the show in other more traditional formats before and evidently has a real love for this material, did something very different here. And this is something that the Bridge Theatre has done before when reconceiving Shakespearean productions for A Midsummer Night's Dream for Julius Caesar. They had this sort of, I don't know if it's technically promenade theatre, I don't know if it's technically immersive. The audience who are standing in the central 
area move around the stage while different hydraulic stage levels come up and down. That's what happens in this production of Guys and Dolls as well. There's also a seated option sat in various circles fully in the round. The stage is set up kind of like a boxing ring in that way where you sit on all sides around it and the standing people are on a lower level than the first sitting people. So different to something like the circle in the square on Broadway. Incidentally, the reason why Guys and Dolls would not work there. Also, unlike Here Lies Love, where the staging pieces moved because they were being pushed around by a team of stage managers, these ones are hydraulic and controlled remotely and move up and down to create uh, different amounts of stage. So many different configurations are used throughout this production. It gives the whole thing a very bustling Manhattan feel. There's a certain amount of chaos to it. It also allows us to create all of these different locations without set pieces because the audience are standing with their eye level sort of at the feet of the actors. If you were to start using too many set pieces, you would start to obstruct sight lines on various different sides. Instead, there's a certain configuration that becomes the mission, there's a certain configuration that becomes a cafe, there's a certain configuration that becomes a bar. The set design is by the wonderful, innovative Bunny Christie. It's one of the great creative triumphs of this production. Another is the choreography by Arlene Phillips and James Cousins that plays into this space very well. This adaptive, occasionally limited space, but it brings a real excitement and exuberance to the choreography there. It's bursting out of whatever staging elements it has at the time. It's one of those shows where you it's one of those shows where you really might get kicked in the face by a member of the ensemble, but you'd probably be grateful for it. Now I mentioned that my feelings about the standing experience had evolved somewhat, and they have, but they've evolved like a less imaginatively designed Pokemon uh, who kind of still looks like their first incarnation with maybe like a couple more stripes. Because I mostly enjoyed it the first time I went and the first time I made a review video here, I just found it a little bit overstimulating. I got to go back for a second time and it was a less full standing area. And that helped, I think, although I still felt a little bit anxious for a moment in the second act. This was the third time I went back to see the show and it was very full again, which made me nervous. However, I was with a lot of people that I knew. I was with a larger group of people that I knew. Some of us got split up, but I sort of decided that I was going to go with the flow this time rather than trying to cultivate what I thought was a good viewing experience for myself and worrying about being at the front and worrying about being on the right side and not getting stuck on a certain side for a certain song and thinking what was coming ahead. I decided to just go with the flow and let everything move me around and I had a more positive experience for doing that because I wasn't in my head about trying to see the show a certain way. I was just going with the tide and that was much better for me. I also think, and people will have their own preferences about this, but if you're anything like my height, I'm five foot 11, the best place for you to be is a couple rows back from the actual stage itself. If you are that tall, you do not need to be at the very front and it won't behove you to be at the very front because things are gonna be happening like down there. It's as though you're at a tennis match. You go slightly further back, you get a better scope. You get a better view of everything that's going on because this is a very busy stage and things happen throughout this show. They use all of the overture time. They use all of the interval time basically for performance. There is always stuff going on in different corners of the stage. If you are a shorter person, you may want to be closer to the stage, but the best thing you can do as a tall person is stand behind a person who is shorter than you because that guarantees you a better view. That's also true for things like fireworks and parades. If you're a tall person, stand behind the shorter people. This is a PSA. I have no idea why tall people position themselves at the front. It doesn't benefit either of you in that relationship. Instead, have a symbiotic relationship where the short person gets to stand in front of you so you don't block them and you get the benefit of guaranteeing a view over their head but where you're further back and you get to appreciate more of it. Anyway, I don't think I really have any tips about good sides to stand on, having now done this from a few different places. I used to say that there was a bad side to stand on for Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, but I then got to experience the show from what I thought that side was, and it was pretty good. And I don't think I gave them enough credit for how well they play to the entirety of the space in that song. The one thing I will say, and I think a lot of people know this trick by now, is that when the interval begins, the stage management will start setting chairs at a few tables on all four diagonal corners of the stage. Once they say you are allowed to, you may 
they sit at those chairs and at the beginning of the second act something exciting happens they will explain to you what that is but you briefly get to be part of the show in even more immersive a sense you do have to be 18 years of age or over to sit in those seats and you do have to show id now bear in mind when you arrive at the theater coats and bags have to be checked in to the coat check at the back of the foyer if you are doing the standing. My advice to you is therefore, if you're planning to do this, to take your ID out of your coat or bag so that you have it with you in the interval because you're going to want to grab one of those seats fairly quickly or they will go. Once at those seats, you can also order cocktails to your location. One of them comes in a coconut. And there are various other interactive things you get to do throughout the show as well. I got soaked with water on this most recent visit. I did not see that coming. I thought I was safe, so I stood up from having ducked down a little bit and got splashed everywhere. They've actually restaged the number of guys and dolls a little bit so that they utilize more members of the audience and they briefly sort of raise them up on different platforms. That's not something that they did with the first cast in the show's first year, so I like that they've found another way to sort of spruce up one of the less thrilling numbers in the show. It does feel as though Nick Heitner has looked at every single moment of this show with Arlene and with the creative team and gone, how can we inject fun and excitement and enthusiasm and thrill into every single number. That's not something you get with a lot of classic musicals. They will often just let the material sing. And that can be, you know, lovely and rich, uh, but a little bit dull sometimes because they weren't written for a modern audience. So this is a really great case study in how to take classic musical comedy and make it feel vibrant. Other examples of that, I love the Havana sequence and what they've done with that. At the end of it, a bar fight begins because they end up in a gay bar and Sky Masterson is dancing with one of the boys in a provocative way and Sarah doesn't like that very much so she punches him and then a whole fight erupts. It may not be the most politically correct thing but I think it's funny. They've also changed the gender of one of the characters so that there's a lesbian couple in the show who get engaged during the song Guys and Dolls. I think that's sweet. Where was there ever LGBT representation in Guys and Dolls before? And it's not substantial but it's nice. But the biggest change in the show obviously is the new couple. Like I said, some principles have stayed, others have changed. Let me tell you about the performances. So, Sky Masterson is now being played by, and I apologize in advance, I'm probably going to get this name pronunciation wrong, George Ioannides? Ioannides? It's somewhere in that family. He is fantastic. I didn't think I was going to enjoy anyone as much as Andrew Richardson in this role, who was in the first cast, and George is not a million miles away from that portrayal, which makes sense, but is every bit the absolutely brilliant leading man that Andrew was. He has such wonderful chemistry with Celinda Schoenmacher, who continues as Sergeant Sarah Brown and ought to have been nominated for an Olivier Award. I'm not going to stop mentioning it. We'll also talk about her in a second, but he is fantastic. He sounds wonderful and he brings this masculinity to it while still being charming. One of my favorite scenes he plays is when he encounters Miss Adelaide and he's sort of venting his frustrations about Sarah to her and he's saying, why is it whenever you get a guy that you like, you immediately want to take him in for alterations. The way that his passion and his motivations come through so clearly when he seeks out the craps game and finds them in the sewer and he's singing Luck Be A Lady. It's very easy to just sing that song, this song that became like a swing standard and has been done by however many people and just do it with like, oh, I really want to win this dice roll. But he injects so much determination and concern and anxiousness into it because he has so much riding on it. He has so much personally on the line, so he's concerned about it. This is a character who we meet cool as a cucumber, and, you know, he's breaking a sweat by this point, and I like that. But it's everything. The accent that he does, the physicality, he is so damn suave. He's excellent. As is Celinda. She opened this show last year. She is staying on in the role. It's a great role for her. It allows her to show the incredible duality of her talent. And there's not a lot of other people who could do what she does with this material because she can give you tonally that classic musical theater leading lady thing, but she also has a very contemporary comedic style. The sarcasm and sass that she brings to the first scene with Skye where she's looking up what she believes to be a Proverbs quote 
in the Bible and realizes that he's correct. It's Isaiah and she's so resentful when she finds out he's right. Everything about the way that she performs If I Were a Bell, she has a lot more life to her than the traditional Sarah Brown. Perhaps she is raunchy and she feels a little bit younger and like she's really ready to throw her entire life away for this man and what he's suddenly awakened her to. And there are also moments of genuine heartbreak when she finds out from Nathan at the prayer meeting in the second act, the sky led him to believe that Sarah didn't go with him to Havana to protect her reputation. She is so visibly like overwhelmed by this. When she's doing If I Were a Bell, she also plays drunk very charmingly. It's like how a child might be drunk for the first time. There's a beautiful naivety to her performance. But the other aspect of this duality with her as a performer is the vocal duality. She has this glorious legit soprano range and this fantastic belt as well. It means that she can color this score very interestingly. We get a really powerful belt at the end of the song, I'll Know, and then for the most part for the rest of the show, she utilizes the belt when she is being a little less Christian and a little more passionate. If there's one thing I love, it's a modern take on classic material, and that's what she has done in this show, I think better than anyone else. Now as Nathan Detroit, the role originally played by Daniel Mays, we now have Owain Arthur. Owain, who I first saw on stage years ago when he replaced James Corden in the comedy One Man, Two Governors, which must also be uh, how he first worked with Nicholas Heitner, I'm guessing. And he's quite a different take to Daniel Mays in this role just as funny, just as well characterized. It's really a very different performance to his One Man, Two Governors performance. I don't recognize a lot of him in the characterization except for the physicality. He does this sort of very jumpy, eccentric, like, oh, I'm doing little steps over here and then I'm gonna turn around and this is happening. And he does that sort of speed of it all very well. He's a lot more animated than Daniel Mays was in this role. He feels a little more clownish in that regard. And that works for him, it works for Nathan. I also, the sweetest thing about his performance is the visible affection for Miss Adelaide. That's a really lovely quality of what he does with the material. Miss Adelaide herself is played by Tamika Ramsey, taking over from the Olivier Award nominated Marisha Wallace. And in many ways, hers is quite a similar performance to what Marisha did, which given that that was sort of a very different interpretation of Miss Adelaide to some of the classic portrayals, means that this is still a very exciting, very vibrant performance that still works on a lot of those other levels. There are some differences between them. I think Marisha played a little more naively. I think there are moments where Tamika feels more knowingly sensual and romantic when uh, the other girls from the hot box, the other dancers are throwing her a bridal shower before she and Nathan are meant to be eloping together. She has this line saying, I think I'll really enjoy being in the kitchen. I've already tried all of the other rooms and that is delivered with considerably more oomph and zest by Tamika. If Marisha's felt more like a wink, Tamika's feels like a double eyebrow raise, if that makes sense as a difference. And I think she feels a little younger in the role as well. Marisha, perhaps in the context of the hot box, felt more like a veteran there and a mother hen and Tamika feels very much more among the other girls. Now those hot box performances themselves remain scene stealing numbers, especially, I mean, the first one, the star of it is the choreography and all of the very graphic things they're doing with carrots. But the second one that reopens the show in the second act, my goodness, the oomph that she gives this performance, just like Marisha did before her. The vocal is powerful and growling and confident. The choreography is attacked. I love everything about it. The final line of Take Back Your Mink is growled like this kind of a Defying Gravity-esque war cry that erupts the audience in applause. I do think if there's one aspect of Adelaide as a character that throughout this production has never really been hit squarely on the head, it's Adelaide's Lament, which is this brilliant character actress comedy song, and it's sort of just delivered. Adelaide in this production is really funny in the spoken material and not as funny in the songs, and I feel like something is missing with her character there. But the humor that she does find in the dialogue with Nathan, I think is funny in a completely different way than any Adelaide has ever been funny before. It's this brilliant, sarcastic, indignant thing, the height of which is when she encounters him on the street towards the end of the show, and she's saying, let us not make a vulgar scene. It's just so good. I want to mention more of the wider supporting cast as well. Nathan Rigg is a standout in those dance numbers. My goodness, phenomenal dancer. 
Camila Fernandez equally in the female dance numbers. Cameron Johnson is still scene stealing as Big Julie. He has this profound low bass voice that just does so many winning punch lines to great writing. And Jonathan Andrew Hume, very endearing as Nicely Nicely Johnson, and does a lovely job of crooning all of the material that he performs in the show's interval. Even if you're not trying to get those seats, by the way, at the tables, in the interval it's worth sticking around in the auditorium or if you do go out coming back a little bit early because there is brilliant interval performance there is song there is dance before the second act this really is like i was saying a show that throws everything it possibly can at you for as much of the duration as possible and while we're talking about people i said this the first time but i must once again pay tribute to the brilliant 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 stage management team if i mentioned in my first review that all of the shepherding and ushering they do of people was a little bit distressed distracting from the action and pulled you out of it occasionally. They've got into such a neat rhythm now that they can do it more silently, they can do it more subtly, and it's far less distracting than I think it was the first time a year ago. But those have been my thoughts about Guys and Dolls at the Bridge Theatre. This remains one of the best shows in town. This is an easy recommendation uh, from me to people who are visiting, who haven't seen any Western shows before. This is still one of the best. Uh, this cast, every bit as good as the first cast. If you haven't seen Guys and Dolls, you need to go and see this production. It's unlike so many other theatrical experiences that you will have. I cannot recommend it enough. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you have enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon about all of your favourite West End and Broadway shows. Make sure to comment down below with all of your thoughts about Guys and Dolls at the Bridge Theatre. Now I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds I'm Mickey Joe Theatre Oh my god, hey Thanks for watching, have a stagey day Subscribe! <laughs>